if you take your Bibles with me and turn to the 29th chapter of the book of Acts. Acts 29. And that chapter should help all of us get closer to that goal. Right? How many of you have found it? Well, you see, it hasn't been written yet. You see, Acts 29, and we're going to get to Romans, so you're close, okay? Don't leave. But Acts 29 is God recording the continuation of the Great Commission. He started it just, just the beginning. And it ends in chapter 28 with the Apostle Paul already facing imprisonment in Rome. But it's gone on for 2,000 years, and we're part of that. The gospel must go forth in this generation through the believers who are alive in this generation So I want you always to think of Acts 29, that uh, God's writing the record of what we do. Well, this evening, the last chapter of Acts is still being written. It's written tonight here and across the world. It's being written in blood and sweat and tears and through our prayers. And it's exactly what God left us here to accomplish. We need sometimes to recalibrate I remember the the old GPS uh, deals. You had to drive around the circle for a while in a parking lot in the early days until it found you and and it got recalibrated. And I know that often, uh, even, you know, the the iPhone, you have to every so often turn it off and start it and it gets it fixed. You know, it needs to get reoriented. Sometimes we need to do that. We need to kind of turn the switch on and off and, and remember why we're here. Because sometimes it's... It's keeping the car going, keeping the house, and keeping the payments made, and keeping the kids going to school, and keeping our health, and keeping the bills. And and we forget the bigger picture of why it is we're even here. Why it is that we don't get, transport me out of here. You know, remember the old Star Trek days when when it got too hot down and wherever they were, they just, out of there. Why does God not do that as soon as someone gets saved? First of all, it helps us really know who's saved because they disappear, you know. That would be nice. But uh, uh, why does God leave us here? It's because he left us here for each of us to be going into the world, our generation and the world he has given to us, and give his word out. Well, what's God's report on your life? What will be written by the Lord in Acts 29 about you and me? That's what this whole conference is really all about. And actually, that's what Calvary Bible Church is really all about. The report of what's going to be written about what we did in our generation for the Lord. Now, this is the great fall season. This is when the football games are going on, right? And it's such a wonderful time. And I want you to kind of, in your mind, think of sports for just a second. And I want to ask you a question. Are you with the team on the field playing Or are you just in the stands cheering tonight? And let me ask you, does the Lord have fans and players? Or just fans? Or just players? You ever thought about that? Have you noticed that the church of today has gotten to the point where we have most of the Christians are the the 80,000 surrounding the sweating group that's out there on the fake grass, you know, running around, hitting each other, and the rest are eating and talking and sitting in their padded chairs and, and everything else and, and screaming at appropriate times. Have you ever thought how the sports almost mirror where the church has gone? That we have our superstars and we pay them a lot of money and they do all the work. And, and we know, it, you know, it costs 200000 to have one in Japan. And it only costs, you know, about 40000 to have one in, in another part of the world. And these are our missionaries and we, and, and they're doing it. And then in America we have the same thing. We have these highly trained professional people that we pay a lot to do the work. And we support them. And they do it. And we're in the stands and we love them. And cheer them on. In fact, we even collect the sports cards. Missionaries pass them out. You know, it has their picture and their stats on it. We collect them. Did you ever think about that? It's, it's just like that. It's amazing. Well, we are now at the moment of the actual game, and that means that, that we each need to think about the whole participation we have. 
I used to be on the Hazlitt football team, so I, many years ago I still have a scar right there. That's before they had this and, you know, all that stuff. They used to have football helmets were dangerous back then. They didn't have all these extra contraptions. It was pretty rugged back then, and so I really got bashed one time, broke my teeth and everything. But I recently told my boys about my early days when I was on the Hazlitt football team. Over the years, various coaches would come in and address us. And what they would do is they'd come down to those smelly locker rooms. That's before they knew about staff and, uh, you know, uh, let's see, what is it called? Vancomycin resistant, you know, MRSA and Versa and all these horrible things that are everywhere. It was before they knew about all that. And they'd come down there, those smelly locker rooms, and they would fire us up. Any of you that were in old-fashioned sports, there were some of those that could really do it. And they'd get us fired up, and, and we would get so excited, and we'd go out to, to go work ourselves to death. We had shown our dedication by joining the team. We worked out most of the summer in the heat before we knew that could kill you if you didn't drink enough water. We ran endless miles of gut-wrenching cross-country up and down the hills. I can remember always the worst hills we had to go up and down. We practiced plays until we could do them instinctively. I remember that you'd run and turn and twist, and it was just, I mean, when you heard that number, you just did it, you know, whatever you were doing. It just, that was just, became an instinct. But when that man came down to the smelly locker room, we were at the actual moment of truth. Fired up meant we were to get even more fully engaged in the game. We were committing to play our best to sacrifice our strength and even our comfort by playing harder. And we committed right there in the locker room not to lose our focus, that we would remember the plays we were taught, that we would unselfishly work together as a team and wouldn't be the ball hog, you know, and the one that wanted all the credit and the glory and the glamour. And all I'm describing is just basic team athletics, team sports. And it doesn't matter if it's football or if it's basketball or if it's baseball or whatever. It is that hard work together. Well, in college days, after my great career in high school, I moved to a different kind of sports involvement. I kind of learned from my pains. I became a spectator and a fan of sports. Again, the stands, uh, all of us in the stands were encouraged to get fired up for the game. This involved, we would wear the team colors, we'd put uh, out our money and get season passes. We'd schedule our Friday nights or Saturdays to not miss any games. We actually would come to all the games. We would sit together with our side. We would pay attention to the game. We knew the other team members. We cheered at the right times, and we were very loud and supportive in whatever they wanted us to do. Some of the more on-fire folks would not only do all that, but they would went further by even dressing and painting their faces with team colors and symbols. They would bring big banners. Some of them would get there early. And generally... They would be everywhere, cheering, jumping up and down, and carrying on. And that's the familiar setting for most of us. In fact, the majority of sports and athletic events are pursued by the minority, the athletes, and they're cheered on by the majority, the fans. And that's where we've gotten to in ministry today, I believe. It's just like the sports. I have two questions for you this evening. And the two questions are, first, where are you in the game tonight? Are you on the team and actually working out, practicing, playing, and on fire for the game? Or are you in the stands? And you're not on fire for the game, you're on fire for the team that's doing the game. You're a spectator. You don't really do that. You know, you don't talk to people. You don't give out tracts. You don't preach. You don't... You encourage other people to do that. But, but you aren't really actually on the field. That description is the majority of normal Christians in America. Second question, if the first question is where are you in the game, the second question is worse, harder. Where did the coach, the God of the universe, through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who bought you with his blood, which place did he ask you to be? In the stands or on the field? Because that's the bigger question. It's not where your church wants you to be, where your leaders want you to be, where culture wants you to be. It's where does the team owner, the coach himself that owns you, where did he ask you to go? That's the big question. 
Most of us, I guess, would be in the stands as spectators. We're quite committed and zealous. We pay for our ticket to the game. That means we give in the church offerings. We come to the home games. That means we attend church faithfully. We annually go to a homecoming game. That's tonight. Some of us even see the team away at training camp. That means we go on short-term missions trips. We encourage the players. That means we support missionaries. We collect their cards with their pictures and stats on them. Thus, we are good fans. We wear the colors. We support the team. We yell and cheer for them and so on. But what does the coach, the owner, our owner, what does he want us to do? Well, the hard part is we have to answer which of the two places did the coach, the God of the universe, through his son, our Lord Jesus, our Savior who purchased us, where did he ask us to be? Which group, the stands or the field, is the one Jesus outlines in the Bible, demonstrates by his life, and set up by his personal earthly ministry? Which of those two groups did he set up? The spectators or the team? Which location is explained in the New Testament when it's played out? When, when all the, the plays that Jesus wrote on the chalkboard for the disciples, when they went out and did it, which of the two were they doing? Spectators or participants? Where did everyone who actually met Jesus Christ on earth end up? They all ended up on the team. Isn't it amazing? We don't see any spectators in the New Testament church. They're all amazingly involved. What did Jesus intend for us to do and to be when he talked about those who would come after? When he told the disciples the the exact instructions they were to give to all of those who in the future days would come, what did he tell them they were to be doing? And did Jesus set up a team and fans or just a team? And who split us into a team and fans? You know, that's an interesting thought, and church history answers that. You know, the the whole clergy-laity thing developed, and the laity were told, you don't, you know, you can't do the holy stuff, and you just give, and we'll do the holy stuff, and you give your money, and we'll do it. And that dichotomy has persisted amazingly. Well, the history of the game and the rule book, God's word has a clear answer. Jesus Christ, our Lord, set up a team that actually practiced, worked out together, played all the games and so on. And there was only a team. There were no non-participating, non-players who could just cheer and come and watch and stand on the sideline and enjoy the game. In other words, there were no first century spectators. Everyone was on the team and they all cheered each other on from the field not from the stands. Isn't that an amazing thing to think about? Just think how much the tickets would cost to be able to be on the field, you know, at the Super Bowl and, and all that. I mean, I know they cost a lot in the stands, but can you imagine? And, and we get invited to be on the field in the greatest game of all. 